nothing the screen has ever shown before can surpass the thrills of the underwater kaiju from out of space podcast created from an atomic fireball hurled from outer space the underwater kaiju from out of space podcast threatens man's very existence on earth The Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcast. Battles Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan for mastery of the world. Men quake before the terror of their unleashed fury. All new, all never to be forgotten. A new high in... Visions from Monsterland. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. My name is Jerry, and joining me to bring you the visions from Monsterlands, we have Mr. Venom. Greetings and salutations, Space Monster fans. Joining us, as always, is also Derek. Good to be back, guys, finally. It is good. And, of course, bringing up the rear, we've got Don. Screonk, everyone. Oh, yes, we are back. It, is, it has been a while. We did a big Ultraman episode, and it was so big that uh, we all took a vacation from Monster Island. It was it was that intense, doing five episodes back to back to back to back to back of Ultraman, or four episodes. How many episodes did we do? Four. 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 Okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah. since then... Uh, we've had Godzilla news, or Kaiju news in general. We've got the, uh, Gamera Arrow box set coming out. Pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty excited Mm -hmm. about that. I know Derek's already ordered it. Uh, I'll hopefully be getting it. So, uh, we, we will give you our full views and opinions on that when that finally comes out. Uh, Has there there been anything else in in the Godzilla atmosphere? Well, um... Nothing big, just a few um, like live action human stars from Ultraman series that have passed away. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's there was a few notes of those I saw pop up, but I mean, other than like the only thing I can think of was I remember reading an article from I want to say Dread Central that said that, there, that Toho was supposed to start their Godzilla verse in 2021. Well, I, they should start that because I want to see it. Yeah, um, I, I remember scrolling it on my feed, and I thought I shared it to my page, but I don't remember if I did or not, and I can't remember if I can't like remember if it was Dread Central, Bloody Disgusting, Fangoria, well, whichever one. Because it a was good one of the, that's what I'm saying. It was one of those sites, and I saw it once. I thought I shared it to my timeline, but I can't remember now. And I haven't seen any other site pick up on it, but it was an article that said that they were supposed to start the uni- the, their Godzilla verse in 2021. Well, if it ain't on Sci Fi Japan, I ain't believing it. Um, <laughs> but it does bring up a good question I'd like to ask all of you. Um, what kaiju do you want to see? Obviously, a Toho kaiju. Do you want to see show up in the in, in the new Toho? Uh, Godzilla verse. I know for me, it's time that Varan comes back. Let's bring Varan in. Varan, Varan, whatever you want to call him. He needs a return. Damn it. Uh, Derek, who would you, what kaiju you want to see? Uh, I was actually going to say Varan too, but I'll yeah. second, me- I was going to second Megalon because he only had one movie too, and I kind of wanted to see him in another movie. Fuck yes. Uh, Don, who, who, who you got? I'm leaning towards Anguirus. I think he'd be a lot of fun to bring back. Okay. He's always been, he's always been one of my favorites, so I'd love to see him back. I could definitely see Anguirus coming Dark, back because he's been in so many of the movies. Dark Horse, though, this is an underrated one. I'd love to see King Caesar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, that's what I'm talking about. Let's, let's bring those underrated cats. Venom, who do you want to see? Oh, I mean, without question, my boy Gigan. Yes, yes. 
Oh, Gigan, how I wish that you had better movies. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> we need to see. We need to see a a, a Gigan and Megalon uh, movie crossover movie together. Like, they just team up. Yeah, like they need to just like almost remake Godzilla versus Megalon. But I also want them to go back to like the original idea of GMK using the more non grandiose Earth Defenders and use like Varen and Baragon like against like in Godzilla and maybe put like Godzilla, Varen, and Baragon going against, you know, Megalon, Gigan and fucking uh like an old school seventy five Mecha Godzilla. Ooh. Ooh. <clears throat> like no more Kiru. Let's get back to like the old school Mecha Godzilla. But if not, if not Mecha Godzilla, um, God, who, uh, what other monster? Fucking Hedora. Hedora. Oh God, no. Well, Hedora is not really controlled by like an enemy force like Megalon and Gigan, so it doesn't quite fit. So I guess you could throw King Ghidorah in there, but I just feel like King Ghidorah is just like too used at this point. So or we like, could use the monster from this movie that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. That would be dope. Uh, that mm. Yeah. Or, you know what? They can finally bring in Bagan and all the kids can stop crying on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Um, God, who would be the perfect person to team up with? Maybe we put... Um, damn, I don't know. I feel like there's someone that should fit Megalon and Gigan perfect, but I can't think of anyone besides like Ghidorah. Who? Megagaris? No, because Megagaris also isn't controlled by an alien outside force. Oh, okay. Like, mm. I kind of want it to fit that that feeling, and I can't really think of anyone that that could go under except for like. Ghidorah. Maybe they create a new one. Maybe we get a new kaiju in there. Orga. Well, we'll just bring back Orga. <laughs> yeah, let's just bring, they could be the ones with the fucked up hands that can't jerk off club. <laughs> wow, Derek. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> He's not wrong. He He's is, not wrong, actually. He is not wrong. <laughs> right. He is. Oh, or we can bring back uh, Mogera because Mogera originally was a robot from space. True. Oh, yeah. Hysterians, yeah. We could do that. All right, well, that was a fun topic. But let's get into this. Today, we are covering Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla from 1994. Um, directed by Kinsho Yamashita. How did I do mm -hmm. on that one? Good enough. Good enough. All right. Uh this is his first time directing a Godzilla movie, but he was an assistant director on Terra of Mega Godzilla. So really, yes, uh, he was assistant yeah. director on that. Um, nice. and then we have the writer. Um, I think it's Kanji Kashiwa. Huh? Huh? Looks good. Yeah, uh, those two actually worked together on uh, Yamashita's uh, big movie. 19 uh yamashita actually comes from doing uh like romance teen movies oh that makes sense yeah mm -hmm. it definitely makes sense doesn't it yep. who, who who's the composer of this one? uh I... the composer give me a second that's the cat i don't want the damn cast i want the crew um original music by takayuki hattori okay which... yeah did he I know. do any other Godzilla? Oh God, he did. He did the music for the Godzilla anime series for Netflix. Yes, and I think he also did uh, some of the music for uh, Godzilla 2000 as well. Oh my God! But he did the music for Mobile Suit Gundam: The Origin, and Mobile Suit Gundam: The Origin was fucking amazing. The music was so good in that. I think it was. I think that was what actually got him the job. What Mobile Suit Gundam Origin? No, yeah, Mobile Suit Gundam Origin came out like three years ago. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, that's that's oh, uh, that's the one that follows Char's story. Oh, uh, he did the music for well, Godzilla two thousand. Well, no, because well, he. 
Well, because he did. I remember Hattori, there was an article that said Hattori was got on the got the job because he did um, this anime. Uh, oh wait, oh, wait he no, did shit, a I'm lot thinking. of anime, but according no, to no, this, no, I'm th- I'm thinking of the guy that did Biolante. I'm th- okay, that's not that's not that's not the the guy in Biolante got the job. Yeah, because according to this, uh, I, I, now, yeah, now I, now I got it right. The, he got Hattori got this job because if Akube turned the thing down, saying the romance was not his type of a film. I okay, so I saw multiple different um, quote unquote excuses as to why Akira of Fukube didn't do it, and none of them were directly from Akira of Fukube. I heard yeah, that I he didn't like the romance, yeah. he didn't like the script changes, he didn't yeah. like uh, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. So I, I don't officially know why Akira Fukube yeah, didn't do it. But he's never, Yeah, he's never specifically stated it, but in all of the press releases, Yamashita said that Fukube turned it down because the romance was not his type of a movie, and that's why he went with the new guy. That's why he went with Hattori. I think the it's not you know romance is not my kind of a movie is just you know an accepted urban legend. It's not actual facts. I would agree with that. I, I do not. I think, think it's, it's facts. I, I think I, it's I I think it's just an accepted urban legend. Yeah, because I also there was also like because there's some that are like really really negative uh, for why he didn't do it, but there's also some that are just like oh well he was involved in another project at the time. So yeah. like. There's 700 excuses, even in, like, the two books that um, – my two Godzilla books that I read before we do Godzilla episodes, both uh, uh, both authors had different quotes as to why he didn't do it. So, I don't think it, it really matters too much. But in Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, we have the return of, uh, return of uh, Megumi uh, Ado- o- Odaka. Odaka. Uh, mm-hmm. As our yep. psychic Miki, who uh, is in every Godzilla Heisei movie, uh, <laughs> from I just Biolante realized. On, yeah. yeah, I just realized today that the Heisei series is really the only Godzilla Arrow that actually has like a good continuity. Continuity, it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, we also have. Um, to- Toako Yoshikawa, damn, I'm bad at this, playing uh, Professor Gondo, who is the sister of the Gondo who died in Biolante. Asian Eric Estrada. Yes, Asian Eric <laughs> yep. Estrada. Uh, and, of course, his best friend, uh, Major Yuki, is here, played by Akira Emoto. Um, we also have, like, Kenji Sahara is here. We've got a couple of return characters in here. Like I said, continuity in this series is actually pretty decent. So, as always, we're going to kind of first go through and talk about our our kind of favorite things, bad things, before we kind of dig into some history and all that good stuff. So, with that being said, let's start it out. Wait, first of all, is this a first-time watch for you, Venom? No, no, not at all. Okay, cool. I never can remember which ones you haven't seen and which ones you have. So always got to double check <laughs> just to be case. So since I'm talking to you, Venom, Venom, what was your favorite thing about Godzilla versus Space Godzilla? I, I mean, honestly, the most striking thing for me was little Godzilla. I thought he was just absolutely adorable, much more likable than the uh, show uh, uh, little Godzilla, whatever we called him back then. I'm sorry, I, the uh, name slips my mind right now. Manila, but yeah, Manila, Manila. Manila thank you. Um, yeah, I just I thought this little guy was adorable, instantly likable. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of scenes with him, which is another thing that I kind of like because if this was an American-made film, we definitely would have gotten more of him just to get the the more youthful audience involved. But I thought we got just the right amount of little Godzilla to make him likable without being too, um, you know, kind of ham-fisted with the cuteness. So, yeah. Agreed. And two fun facts about him. Uh, the redesign was because the director did not like the dinosaur look of the previous Godzilla Jr. in uh, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. 
But uh-huh. the other fun fact is one of the reasons he wanted the redesign to be so much cuter is because he was actually pitching them a uh, little Godzilla TV show that he wanted to make. Hmm. Oh, yeah? Yes. Live action or? Animated? Live action. Ah. He, it, it was um, something like uh, Little Godzilla in the Underground Mystery or something like that. Um, so he wanted to make a show or an OVA or some kind of special with that, but it just never came to fruition. But Yeah, he, yeah I, I was just going to say I do like the look of him too and stuff. and It, like, it gives it like that chibi vibe with the look. Yes, you know I mean? uh, it is my favorite of the quote unquote baby Godzilla uh that we ever see. And there's a lot of people that hate it and prefer the Godzilla versus Mega Godzilla 2 design. But to me, this is what Manila should have looked like in the first place from the Showa series. Yeah. It's yeah. adorable. I fucking love it. And uh, I think the director made made the right choice in making it look super cute. Because think how much better Son of Godzilla would have been. If you would have had her throw in the the fruit into that little Godzilla's mouth instead, instead of Pillsbury Doughboy, exactly, that awful awful Juno Dewart looking thing. Uh, so I, I think we're. Uh, does anyone here not like the little Godzilla design? I'll take that silence as everyone loves it. Um, I like the design. I don't think it looks like a Godzilla. It looks like a Godzilla offspring. That, that that's the thing. I, Godzilla Junior from '93 looks more like a Godzilla offspring, but I like this design a little more. It just seems weird for that's me fair. that he goes. It just seems weird for me that he goes from like the angular hard, hard angle design in the face to the puffy round one when that's not an that's not you know advanced evolutionary stages you know your face act you know it goes the other it goes opposite you should have a puffier rounder face in the beginning and then your your it hardens up and gets more defined chiseled and defined as you age so to go backwards i think kind of makes them like less evolutionary like it makes them like less of a Godzilla offspring than the 93 design, but I like the look of it a little bit more. It's more appealing. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can get behind that. I mean, my question would be is, I mean, who, how do Kaiju spawn? Like, are, are we, are we assuming that Godzilla <laughs> is asexual and just, uh, well, while never specifically shown, we do know from the Showa series that Manila came from an egg. Right. Yeah, that's, also, that's my question. Like, who laid that egg? Blah, and, blah, blah. Unless you include a really obscure Japanese Godzilla, uh, like, one shot uh, manga where they specifically state that Godzilla is a female, but that's also, you know, where Godzilla comes from a different planet, turns into a spaceship to go to that different planet. Oh, uh, yeah. So, unless you consider all that, we don't know Godzilla's sex, and we technically do not know how. He, she reproduces. Uh, the closest thing we have is there is an egg involved. Sure, sure. No, understandable. I mean, it's not like we ever see kaiju going at it or anything. So, well, going at well, it in a fun a... way. Well, not there's officially. A book series, book series that will have that. I can point you to some deviant art stuff if you would like to see kaiju. <laughs> oh, there's an. I'd rather not. <laughs> no, there's an no, there's an actual legitimate book series that has that too. But is it that has canon actual under kaiju relations? Yeah, there's an actual series of books out there that have human that actually have human kaiju relations. Okay, Aye. but is it Toho canon? Like, is it licensed under Toho, or under is that it just qualification? Under that qualification, no. Okay, then it then it doesn't count. That's the same as. Someone drawing Godzilla having sex with Angerus on DeviantArt. <laughs> so I, I, I don't count that unless Good it's types. official Toho stuff. Um, okay, we will move on. Um, Don, what, what is your favorite thing from Godzilla versus Space Godzilla? Even though he really doesn't do anything, I think Space Godzilla is the best of the the Heisei original creatures. I 
I love that crystal look to him. I think that's really striking and impressive. It's one of it's probably one of my favorite underrated de- designs, actually, and it's easily my favorite of the Heisei series in terms of original creatures. Oh, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I I'm a big Space Godzilla fan. I I have multiple Space Godzilla yeah. figures. I have an X Plus figure. I have the big Trend Master figure. I have yeah. a one that lights up from Japan. Yeah, I've got a I've got the the trend the big Trend Masters one myself. Yeah, the the one that is the like. Re- really blue and and his stomach is yellow and red and green. Yeah, I, yeah, I got that one right there. It's actually like two feet away from where I'm sitting. Yeah, mine's like three feet, but he's over there on my shelf. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, I still think that the Heisei Godzilla design and the Fire Rodan design in '93 are better, but in terms of original creatures, Space Godzilla is the best of the Heisei monsters. I, I mean, I agree with you. I'm biased though, because I absolutely love Space Godzilla. I just the idea to me of of evil Godzilla right. works so much to me. And even though technically what they really did was was like, remember when we used Super Godzilla in the in that Super Nintendo game? What if we did that but made it evil? That's basically what they did. Which I'm fine with. So, does everyone here like the Space Godzilla design? Venom, how do you feel about Space Godzilla? Oh, I love the design. I think it's great. I do not like the design when he's flying. I think he looks too much like a toy. I mean, he doesn't move almost at all. Exactly, yeah. He looks like a model, you know, a model kit that's hanging from your ceiling. I want a flying (laughs) Space Godzilla Christmas ornament. There you go. <laughs> As a Christmas ornament, yeah, that's very acceptable. Holy In the context shit. of the film, I just thought it looked, you know, a little too plastic. But as far as his standing design, I loved it. I loved the spikes, kind of the crystal spikes kind of jutting out of his uh, shoulders. Um, I liked his abilities. I liked how his version of Atomic Breath didn't actually go straight. It had, like, angles to it. Uh, oh, yeah, overall, I really like Space Godzilla, his design anyway. Sweet. All right. Derek, what is your favorite thing about Godzilla versus Space Godzilla? Hmm. I kind of like the idea of Space Godzilla, what he's like his origins, even though I, I do have an issue with some of the reasons of his origins, like kind of like a throwaway line there and stuff. I do like the set designs of like all the crystals and shit when you know it it adds to the ambiance of the actual fights when we do get to them and it shows like he's trying to take over the world and make it his own i like the idea of what he's trying to do with our earth and trying to take it over you know what i mean i like the concept of what he could do and the power of it yeah he's he well i i want to say according to uh the fairies they they say uh, Space Godzilla doesn't want to take over the Earth. He wants to destroy Godzilla and the Earth. Yeah. Like, he's got a grudge against Godzilla for killing Biollante or whatever. Though, technically, this movie gives us two explanations out as to the origin of Space Godzilla, both involving a black hole, but uh, one being uh, cells from Biollante going into space and the other being cells uh falling of godzilla's falling off mothra i lean towards the biolante because if you look at space godzilla's mouth i think that reminds me of biolante yeah but he also has batra's uh kind of headpiece but did batra go into outer space are you saying there was batra cells on mothra when mothra went into outer space along with the godzilla cells it might have been yeah, they give two explanations, so it's kind of up in the air which one you want to go with. I, I don't see both of those explanations working at the same time, because well, thinking... how do they find the same fucking black hole? Well, thinking back on the final battle, Mothra and Bat- Batra never had any physical contact with each other. So I don't think Batra can be a legitimate candidate. Because, remember, Batra died before... Batra died on conduit on route from dragging Godzilla away and dropping him out to sea. So it never got to go into space. 
and there's never there was never any physical contact between Mothra and Batra while they were together while they were together either fighting each other or fighting Godzilla. The the only problem with that too though is unfortunately which this movie kind of ignores is this movie came after King Ghidorah. Well, that's well, always been my theory is that Gid- it, Ghidorah never rewrote history. Ghidorah, Ghidorah set history. They we were are destined not. To, I know we're, we're not, we're not getting into, into the well, craziness of time travel. We we did that, and I don't want a headache. Yeah, yeah I, I, know. I, I don't want to get back into it, but like I said, that just furthers my theory that it set history, not changed it. Yeah, so but that's that's not an argument for this show. Yeah, so me personally, I lean more towards the the Biolante cells. Um, just because of how many characters we have in this that relate that go back to Biolante's yeah. movie and and the mouth on Space Godzilla, to me it just seems like the Biolante is the better answer, and they really didn't need to put the second excuse of of Mothra, except for the fact that they're showing, look, we're looking at all our options. So, eh, okay. Uh, as for me. This is a movie where I really like the human characters. They are not overboard. Everything is kind of subtle. Uh, There's a good mixture between the human characters and their drama and the the monster drama. Uh, Even though we have two separate romances going on in this movie, they're very understated. They're not in your face. Um, It it subtly shows how uh, these two military men... Uh, change their viewpoints on Godzilla as they fall in love with their respective women. And at the end of the movie, you get to see, you know, them kind of accepting Godzilla because of the two women. And then the one guy who didn't get love is like, fuck you, Godzilla. We'll have a rematch someday because he didn't (laughs) have anyone to love him. So just in general, like I actually just really, I mean, we got to see Miki, become more actually. of a fucking character. She she actually got to be in the forefront this time instead of in the background. And Yuki is just an amazing character all around. I fucking love He Yuki. is my favorite character. Yeah. Oh my god, so good. So, and and this is um this is my favorite of the Heisei movies. Um uh I know that's that is not the same for a lot of people, but to me it's just, it's got great characters without overdoing it. Uh, the big monster fight at the end is like a goddamn kaiju shootout. Like, you got them shooting, uh, lasers and fucking, uh, missiles and fucking crystals. It is just ridiculous. Uh, the set design, uh, that Derek brought up in this movie is, is great. Uh, when Mogera gets, like, uh, like, on its last leg and it runs Space Godzilla and then you have, um... Uh, Shinjo looking for Yuki and he's going through all the destruction like that looks amazing uh, the miniatures look really good um, to me this movie has just a really good balance going through it which is kind of funny because like a lot of what I'm saying a lot of people complain about that for this movie so <laughs> speaking of complaints we're going to get into complaints, and since I went last, I get to go first. Um, my real biggest complaint about this movie is is the score. It, uh, it, it's, it's lackluster, even though I like what I call the jungle song that plays like four or five times in this movie. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of overdone. Uh, a lot of times the soundtrack is getting over... You don't even hear the damn soundtrack because of explosions and everything, and just... In general, I just thought the soundtrack is really lackluster and not rememberable, not memorable. And I just I really do wish there would have been a better soundtrack. I like I like like I said, I like the jungle song. Kind of reminds me of some June Fukuda movie shit, and I'm all about that, but it just I really wish they would have improved the soundtrack. So with that being said, Derek, what did it you like about this movie? Uh Oh boy, uh, fuck! I'm, I have so many that I get off the top of my head. Uh, I'll I'll nitpick something. I didn't really like how that 
scientist dude kind of turned evil all of a sudden. He was probably my least favorite character because he looked like a fucking... Because uh, I knew, like, the first time I'd ever seen this movie, he's going to turn bad, ain't he? And, yeah, he <laughs> turned into a fucking asshole. You know, I knew, like, this whole Project T thing was all fucking for self-preservation. I, I just hate that whole concept in general, you know? Okay, fair enough. Uh, Don, what did you not like about this movie? The writing. I think the human stories, the, the human characters are the weakest aspect of this. Hmm. Well, I'm in a disagreement, but fair enough. What? Yeah. Like, is there anything specific, like, that you can think okay. of? Oh, um, I, let me, let me see here. Let me just uh, dive into something here. Okay. Okay. So, um. I don't care for the romance angles in here. None of them are either or satisfactorily explained. I mean, Mickey and Yuki just spend the, I mean, Mickey just spends the entire time arguing over everything about whether or not it's right for her to be devoted to Godzilla instead of servicing humanity. And then at the end of it all, she's supposed to fall in love with him. Well, like, she doesn't fall in love with Yuki. She I, I know. Yeah, the I, older girl. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That I think would be a I, totally different she, movie. Yeah, Yuki falls in love with it's Yuki and Shinjo, and yeah, no, then I think I, I think I looked at my notes and said her said that the wrong yeah, the wrong and then here. Professor Gondo and uh, Major Yuki. Yeah. yeah, but I'm saying and Mickey's romance is completely underwhelming. I mean, I just I can't even think Gondo and Yuki have any purpose in the film at all. It's just <laughs> outright unnecessary. And See, then uh, I like that it's understated and I like that it I mean, shows I, that these people that want but, revenge on Godzilla so bad can be but, yeah, but turned around but by love. But here's I, well, I, I get that. But here's where my where my thing is the entire time. It's just them going back and forth, arguing at each other over whether or not Mickey should be using her psychic powers for the betterment of the project. That's all of their interactions together. There's barely anything else to suggest that she would actually fall for him uh, based on their interactions together. I actually that's... don't know what movie you watched because Shinjo doesn't care if she'll use his her psychic power. It's more of her bitching at him because all he does is think about fighting and killing Godzilla. But he right, never that's... really talks but about... But you said that... It's more of the other guy. I... Yeah, because you said like. it was about her, whether she should use her psychic abilities to save them or not. While really, that only comes up like once in the beginning of the movie between uh, Mickey, Professor Gondo, and Professor Akubo. And she well, only gives in because uh, of two things. One, they're going to use a child instead of her if she doesn't agree. And two, she changed her story completely when the fucking fairies show up and be like, Space Godzilla's coming. Get your shit together. <laughs> and then we never deal with her like what like oh i shouldn't use my abilities to to hurt, hurt godzilla it becomes more of why do you people want to fucking kill godzilla all the time you stupid men yeah i actually like the the uh professor gondo and yuki stuff because you know gondo was our favorite character from biolante it was good that they brought that storyline kind of back in that sense and use some aspects to it and i like and i want to think now that they fell in love and stuff that they could relive his memory when naming their son or something, little Eric Estrada. Yeah. And think about how <laughs> pimp Yuki is when, okay. So right before he gets into, uh, Mogera, uh, Yuki, um, or, uh, fucking G Gondo's like, remember when you said that, uh, I have, we have to find something to live for. Well, I found what I live for as she stares at him seductively. And he's just like, my lighter's empty. Really? Go fill it. <laughs> Go fill it. <laughs> Which is great because it's him saying, you know, you're filling me now instead of Godzilla, even though he he's still not fully there because he's still like in the middle of he's like, we're not going to fight Space Godzilla. We're going to go fight Godzilla instead until he gets knocked the fuck out. Um, but I like it. Like if someone was mad at the whole lighter thing. I couldn't argue that. I get what I they were going for, that. but they kind of ruined it with having him go and fight Godzilla 
instead of Space Godzilla when the whole, like, metaphor of that is that you are filling me up now instead of Godzilla as the reason I live. Sure. But it's still pimp as fuck. Exactly. I actually like his response to the professor's statement there because it comes off as a very Han Solo, I know, type response. And I thought it was perfect. I actually loved it. <laughs> well, there's oh, there's even a God. Star Wars scene in this movie when you know when Captain Mogera fucking detaches. Stay on target. Yeah. The screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah. now I will say, Don, you are not alone in hating the characters. Um, when I was uh, doing my research, I pulled out my Japan's favorite Monstar book by uh, Steve Rifle, and he agrees with you completely. He. He gives this movie one star. He shits on, like, everything in the movie. He doesn't like the characters. He has your same point of view when it comes to the romance being pointless and not doing anything. Um, So while I disagree, one of the Mm -hmm. most knowledgeable people about uh, Kaiju ever agrees with Don. So we're going to point that out. But I will say that while also saying... uh, there is, the other book I have uh, a critical filmography a critical look at the Toho Godzilla filmography book by oh fuck what's his name Gazicheski no not him it's not him um um, um fuck I, I damn know it too. Uh, um <laughs> it's either I mean I know, the only guys I know are Rifle August and Gazicheski so if it's not one no. of those three I don't. It's not him. He's one of the newer guys. Well, that's it. what I'm saying. All I know is just those three. Um, uh, fuck. I've I know, gotta, I, I've gotta I know who it is because I actually have another book by him. He wrote that Mushrooms and Clouds one. Steve the Callum. Show. Uh, he did not write the Mushroom and Clouds one. Is it Steve Callett? It is not Steve Callett. Okay, then those are the, those are the only names then. Uh. Well, anyways... Um, I mean, beyond the mon- beyond the humans, my biggest issue is with the monsters themselves. Well, hold, hold, hold up. You already gave okay. one. You can't give another one because Venom well, no, still hasn't gone. Of, well, it's part of my whole thing. I, I said the writing. No, that's a complete... Uh, well, what, well, how is the writing affecting the monsters, though? No, that's what I said. My biggest complaint was the writing, and then I started with the humans. Okay, so how, how does the writing of the monsters... What didn't you like? Also... Well, Real quick, okay. uh, his name is David Collat. Oh, well, I got the last name right, at least. Okay, but for the monsters, there's no purpose for Space Godzilla to arrive on Earth. Disagree. Yeah. Okay. The fairy Fine, gives then. a clear excuse why. He All right, wants then. revenge on Godzilla okay. for killing Biollante. All right, then how about answer me this? Do the crystals appear anywhere else on the globe and we're just not there to witness it because we're focused on the actions in Japan? No, because he clearly sends the crystals to the island where uh, Godzilla, Godzilla has last been because Yuki says Godzilla has shown up like three times since I've been here. And that's where baby Godzilla is. So he was sending him directly to where he can feel Godzilla is because that's a big thing with all the Toho Godzilla movies is the monsters can always sense where they're at. Even back to Godzilla versus King Kong, they did that nonsense so you just kind of have to accept that as a fucking toho thing at this point it's like a kaiju force yeah yeah okay. kaiju force yes uh, all right so okay, i can answer then. that one hey can you tell i've seen this movie way too much yes okay then how about this one okay what's so special about Fuki- fukuoka that couldn't be achieved at tokyo tower which is a taller and therefore more worthwhile conduit for cosmic energy wooden floating around in base accomplish the same thing anyway i don't have an answer for that one because that they've never really specifically said why they wanted to do that the i the only thing i could think of is as a director i wanted to use a different area yeah you know i want to use tokyo. something i don't i'm tired of using tokyo let's use some one area now this does kind of backfire because right when this before this movie came out there was an earthquake in fukikawa Fukuoka. 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 Thank you, Don. Yeah. Don has to correct me on all of these names. Chumbawamba. Chumbawamba. I know that uh, from sumo wrestling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, that actually kind of backfired. And Toho actually during like the last three weeks of theatrical run 
lowered the ticket prices in honor of the people who who got died or hurt or lost things in the earthquake um so yeah yeah but i'm just saying is that you know if it's doing all of this to gather cosmic energy isn't just flying around in space going to accomplish the same thing like why come to earth for it well because he wanted to kill godzilla because he's made of godzilla's cells okay but godzilla's not dead yet so why godzilla's not dead yet from their first battle i mean he's clearly still alive so shouldn't he have pressed the advantage i mean you know no he probably wasted a lot of energy getting to earth uh and needed to recoup energy so he went to go recoup energy well then i mean like i said why fukuoka i mean tokyo tower is a taller and more you know that's going to come down to straight production where the director just wanted to do something that wasn't Tokyo Something again. That we've seen also, hundreds of times. this movie budget wise uh, is slightly smaller than um, a few of the other Heisei movies. Um, so it was probably cheaper to not have to build Tokyo. So the question is not the answer to your question is not in the the story or even the writing. It's in the production. Mm, I mean, I guess if I mean, yeah, that's fine. I would just rather like in universe explanations not in production values i agree but also maybe that was the closest i don't know where this island is so maybe for space godzilla that was the closest place he felt the energy so he went to the first place he felt the energy that could Mm. be i know at one point they show like a map of where Space Godzilla is, where Godzilla is, and where Mogera is, but I don't know if it shows in relatively to that where the fucking island that Yuki was chilling at is. Yeah, and they don't show where Birth Island is and destroy us, so... Yeah, so I can come up with logical reasons, um, but I also think that your complaint of, well, why not Tokyo, also has nothing to do with the writing. Mm. Still a good question, it... though. So, I don't know. I, I just don't really see that as an issue with the writing as much as... Well, okay. Because it's the same as me answering with production. You're asking a question. Well, well here's, here's the thing. All you have to do is just give me one line that says... Fukuoka Tower was built with a special mineral that acts as a it acts as a superconductive cosmic energy, you know, system, and so it's going there because it's going to gather gather the energy much more efficiently than it would anywhere else. I mean, something like that. Okay, you know, that's all you have to do to get me on board. And- yeah, but that's a lot for for something that that your your argument is. Why did he choose this city over this city? And like any, yeah, per, like, like even if in story, if I say that place was closer to him than you Tokyo, say, yeah, honestly, you could say it, that about any like other kaiju movie when they take place in other places. With, yeah, uh, they just Tokyo. mix it up. Variation. I will say this: there was a quote I read from the director, um, where he was talking about um, how he sh- struggled with trying to keep a quote unquote realism to a Godzilla movie because he had never done really a movie like this by himself. He had only assisted directed in 1975 a Godzilla movie. Um so I would say because of that, I don't think he would put in a line making up some like sw- like pseudoscience about a mineral that makes this tower better blah 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 like I don't know. I just feel like that like that complaint is is very nitpicky, and I feel like all of my answers to it are like, even if it is oh production or whatever, are just as bad of an answer to how bad the question is in dealing with your complaint about writing. Because I don't think it has I mean, anything just, to do stuff with stuff like the that. Generally, rears its head when you watch a movie over and over again. 
So, I mean, I think when directors make movies, they're more concerned with people who are going to see this, you know, once in the theater, you know, shell out their money to come out and see it opening weekend or opening week, whatever. They're not really concerned with people who are going to purchase this movie and then watch it 50, 100, 200 times over the course of their lives. Because honestly, I mean, we're all horror movie fans here. What horror movie could we watch 100 times and not? nitpick something about the writing or Jaws. characterization or things like that. So, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think I Don's question one. is valid. I just think that it's, it, it's a product of watching a movie many, many times. Mm. Uh, I suppose. I mean, I mean, I get where he's coming from. It's just, I mean, you know, just to, like to make the story just like gel together. I mean, it, to me, it just seems like a basic question, like, why would it choose there? Because, yeah, I mean, you are right. I mean, there could be, you know, there there could be a distance thing where Tokyo would be closer, but then, you you know, you choose Fukuoka just, you know, for, you know, be, you know, like artistic purposes. Like, I want, you know, I came from Fukuoka. I want to honor where I came from. I mean, you know, you can do something like that, but it's just, for me, I just like the story. You know, it just it just feels like an extension of like an underwhelming story. So, I mean, I do agree. I will agree that it might come off as a little nitpicky. But when I watch it, I just I like, you know, simple stuff like that to just make sense. And, you know, it's the site of the major battle. I mean, there should be something important about it to where, you know, you chose to set it there to begin with. And I just I, I didn't get it. There's but... just no reason. I would also say, I mean, keep in mind yeah. that that to the Japanese, there are more cities than Tokyo. To uh, well, yeah, us and, outside like of said, Japan, I mean, like, because like I, I feel said, like you're like, saying, why not Japan? Because Japan's the most well-known place outside. Like, why not Tokyo? Because in that's when we, when us in Japan, outside of Japan, think about the big cities in Japan, we think Tokyo. So why, why isn't it in Tokyo? But to the Japanese, they're probably like, Okay, yeah, it's a, it's another giant city. If they had real balls, they said it in Hiroshima. Okay, oh, Jesus. wow. Uh, <laughs> no, if they had real balls, soon. they would set it in uh, Akihara, and they would kill all the fucking uh, anime kids over there, all the fucking neats, <laughs> and fucking... <laughs> fuck you and your fucking body pillow. Uh. Uh, no, but, like... Don, do, like, why do you feel it has to be Tokyo when... Is it because, like, when you think Japan, you think Tokyo? Well, he well, was talking I'm about the Tokyo Tower. The Tower, like I'm saying, yeah. it goes to Fukuoka and it just stands there gathering cosmic energy from Fukuoka Tower. If it's... That's the entire purpose for why it's going there. My point is Tokyo Tower is a bigger, much more conductive, you know, system. How do you know? Because Tokyo Tower is the tallest structure in the in the country. But maybe it doesn't have to. Like, what does it being tall have to do with it? Because you say cosmic energy, but I disagree. I thought it was getting energy from because the all of the Earth. energy beams are flowing out of the sky. That's what it's. That's what it's doing. It's gathering cosmic energy from space. See, I disagree because when I watch no. it, I look at specifically the part when uh, Mogera breaks apart and they go underneath to try to break down the tower. And when they're looking at the diagram underneath, it looks like there's all these like fucking uh, like vines going down into the ground, sucking energy from the earth. I always saw the electricity that's mm. shooting out from the crystals. That's not energy coming from space coming down. That's energy from the crystals that it's getting from the earth. Yeah, shooting sucking to the space earth. Godzilla sucking the earth's energy. When out. it when it first arrives, there's energy bolts that are flowing out of the sky and they fl they fly into the crystals yeah specifically when but, he's attacking okay, but, godzilla but that's yeah. at the island when he's in the city it looks more like it's getting energy from the earth and then sending that energy to space godzilla through the electricity from the crystals to space godzilla like derek you said mm -hmm. you, you you agree with me yeah, I, I, it looks like it's coming from the earth, and they just because the, he sends the crystals down to earth in the beginning to absorb energy for him to get down there to begin with. Yeah, and that's probably I'm, I'm because saying, those. When, but I'm saying when it first arrives in Fukuoka and it establishes itself at the tower, the first five or six 
like the first times you see it, there's like yellow energy bolts raining down from the sky onto the tower and they flow into Space Godzilla's crystals. That's what it's doing there. It's there. I disagree. I don't think it's doing that. I don't think it's taking energy from space. I think it's taking energy from the Earth. Well, why would it take energy from Earth if it's a space creature? Because it's about to destroy the Earth. Because just because it's a space space creature, creature, it can take energy from planets. It's a space creature. It would take energy. It would take the cosmic energy from space. It would take the energy from space. Just because, because that's, he came from where, space? Uh, how many monster movies have we seen where creatures come from space and take energy from the Earth? It's a, it's a very common trope. Even in Godzilla movies. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, everything I've said says that it's there absorbing cosmic energy. Energy from I, space. Well, one, it never says anything in the movie about absorbing cosmic energy. And for you, when you... you you're saying you want answers from inside the script. Where are you getting this cosmic energy thing? Because it sounds to me like you're doing what I'm, I'm doing, just the opposite way, where you're taking well, my what thing you're seeing I and never, make... Don, let me finish what I'm saying. Don, let me finish what I'm saying. Okay? You're doing exactly what I'm doing. You're taking what you see in the movie and coming to your own conclusions. The only difference is, is I'm saying... When I'm saying, I'm saying, well, I feel like they're doing this... You were saying, well, no, he's a space monster, so he's getting cosmic energy from space because he's from space. But I don't think there's anything in the movie that makes your statement more true than the statement I'm saying of how I see it. Well, it just every time I've seen it, all of the energy beams that I see floating down on it look like cosmic energy. So, it, But what, what makes it cosmic energy? Because a lot of that electricity that we see going from like the crystals to Space Godzilla looks just like the energy he's shooting out of his mouth and at nowhere is that called a cosmic ray or cosmic energy you're you're creating you're putting words into things to make it understandable to you but there's nothing in the movie that that supports that is what i'm saying just like technically there's nothing in the movie that supports what i'm saying that he's taking energy from the earth because it's never stated we're just using context clues uh to to make us to help us understand how we feel about the movie, but I just feel like you you're going oh because he's from space it has to be cosmic it has to be this and I'm just saying that I don't see it that way and I well don't... the only way the only way that would work would be the news reports. Well, no, I mean any, uh, anyone I'm just in thinking, the well, there's news reports in there's news reports when it first arrives. And, you know, all of the evacuation plans and all that nonsense, unless there's something said in there, then, yeah, I would I would I'll I'll concede to that. Yeah, I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm not saying I'm I'm, right. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying the only way to know for sure is rewatch it and then get to because I know that I know for a fact that there's news reports on what on its arrival there. And unless there's something stated in those news reports, then, yeah, I'll concede to that. I mean, Is anyone else that blanking out about news reports? I don't remember news reports. Yeah, yeah. there's audio. There's there's definitely news. Um, the, the, the audio of news reports, and then I there is one of the, scene the, the military people on talking. camera. No, there's no, there is that well, one short-haired okay. woman too who's on yeah, camera. There's a yeah, there is a news report about. Yep. I think some I think some reporter is doing a story anyway, and then it shows up, and she just starts covering it. Oh. Yes. Well, yeah. honestly, if they were going to do like an explanation of like cosmic energy or where, or what it's doing, like power, it would honestly come from like the the scientists or the military. I doubt it would show up in the news report. Yeah. Well, unless the news report is co- is explaining that to the citizens. So. Yeah, like but I where said, would they would get be... that information? Like, well, yeah, the government's not the giving that out. Right. Well, I like see that I mean... point though, because I do. I do. There are scenes in the movie where uh space godzilla it looks like he's getting energy from something above him he's being struck it could just be lightning it could potentially it could just be lightning but there is definitely some kind of power that's striking him from above and then he's able to shoot his you know his uh his attack at godzilla so i mean i do see what don is seeing i think don is just um interpreting it differently than maybe most of us are i didn't even i didn't even attempt to interpret it i just saw he's collecting energy from something it could be from space it could be from inside the earth whatever the case may be 
but he is definitely well, collecting well, energy to be able to shoot that attack. So. Well, you know what that means? Audience, you have to let us know what you think <laughs> and give us your reasons why. So so you can sway yeah. some of us and, and there's got to be some expert out there. But but with that, let's move on to Venom. Venom, what did you not like about this movie? I mean, there wasn't really anything glaring that I didn't like. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were two very minor things. Very, very minor. One piggybacks on your complaint, Jerry, about the soundtrack. But I'm going to I'm going to be more specific and say specifically the Mogera song. The song that plays whenever Mogera shows up is so disgustingly triumphant and almost military like that it just it bothers me because the character or, or the, you know the the robot or whatever you want to call it isn't established as this unbeatable superhero like an ultraman or a godzilla yeah. so to have to have music that's that triumphant like every time he shows up and it plays that song it's like he's about to save the day but he never really does so I don't you know think what, he deserves that song. I, you know, I, what, you know I, what it reminded me of? The that? fucking Super X2 theme. Yes. You know, <laughs> Almost I, exactly. I agree with you because I just don't like the song. But I do think I can explain it. Go ahead. Uh, a lot of times in the in the Godzilla movies, we have the, the U.S. military with this huge, like, ego and hubris. Every time, like... We built Mecha Godzilla. It can beat Godzilla. We built Mogero. It can beat Godzilla. We built Kiru. We can beat Godzilla. Like so, I think maybe that triumphant song, and this is maybe giving them too much credit, is a representation of how cocky and egotistical, uh, and how much their hubris is that they think that they're gonna win because they're the the best. But in reality, they've used uh the the uh, technology from Mechagodora, which then was turned into building the Mecha Godzilla, which is then turned into building Mogera, and it's and, and it's like you're putting the your fake uh, industrial complex against a natural animal. I want to say a natural god, but I guess I shouldn't. A nat like. Something natural. Natural is always going to beat out over robotics in the Godzilla world because in Godzilla world it's all about like pollution or nuclear threats or how humans are are hurting the earth and stuff like that. That's always been a big theme there. And there's also the big theme of the government being egotistical and, and having so much hubris. Uh, especially when you go back to movies where you're looking at it's the reporters that are saving the day or it's the scientists that are saving the day and it's less the government doing it. Especially when you look at like Shin Godzilla and how the government is so constricted with red tape and, and all this shit that they can't get anything done in time. Sure. I mean, I can't disagree. I just feel that it's undeserved. That's all. You, you know, what I, I agree. You know what I usually <laughs> did? Having my headphones on, but the Megazord fucking when they morph into the Megazord oh and he's rebuilding. <laughs> go, go, Power Rangers, dude. That's what it reminded oh me. Oh, my God. Not bad. Not bad. And then the only other minor thing was just one shot that just brings – it brings the movie down like 20 years. Um, and that's the shot of the scientists floating in space. Yes. I was going to say looks, something. It looks like 1970s video toaster technology. It looks so out of place. It, it took me completely out of the movie. I had to stop the movie because I was laughing so hard. I thought I was, I was playing missing Wing dialogue. Commander. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that shot. I Where's mean, Mark they Hamill? literally just should not have even used it. I understand why it's there, you know, to establish, you know, Space Godzilla's how dangerous he is and the fact that he destroyed a space station, blah, 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 or spaceship, whatever it was. But, yeah, that shot was just so poorly done, amateurishly done, that it just should not have been used. It brought down the whole movie for me. And the thing is, is that you could also make the argument that it looks so bad that it's laughable and that it actually might bring a smile to your face. I, I, you know, because it literally looked like Sesame Street 70s, like electric <laughs> company technology. It was awful. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, let's talk about Mogera. Mogera originally came to us from the Mysterians, where it was a robot being controlled by aliens. But in this movie, Mogera is built by uh, the Japanese military. And Mogera, and I want to give them credit for this. 
because I was kind of like, you really, when I watched this as a, as a kid, I was like, or not a kid, but before I, I knew about this, uh, you shoehorn Mogar in from a different movie where he was an evil aliens robot. And now he's basically just a Kmart version of Mecha Godzilla. Uh, but I do want to give them credit because they did make Mogera turn into an acronym and Mogera stands for Mobile Operation Godzilla Universal Expert Robo Aerotype. <laughs> That's a real thing. But uh, let's talk about Mogera's design. Uh, Don, how do you feel about Mogera's design in this movie? It looks sleek. Like It looks like a natural predecessor of the Mecha Godzilla. I just I don't get the feeling that it's a more powerful robot, though. I don't feel like it's an it's an improvement. Nail on the head. Don is 100% right. In my opinion, Don's right there. It doesn't look like an improvement over Mechagodzilla. In fact, originally, it was supposed to be Mechagodzilla. Uh, but they changed it be- basically merchandise. Ooh. Is why they changed it. Yeah, so they can make a new figure toy. because Godzilla makes a lot of money off merchandising. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Derek, what did you think of Mogera? You know, I kind of like the aspect that it did turn to other machines because I thought it was actually doing better when it's not the actual Mogera, but when it's the actual machines. Like, it was actually hitting, it looked like the hits were affected Mecha Go- Space Godzilla, I mean, more. Did that make sense in the battle? Yeah. But, mm-hmm. you know, I like the design, but I think it kind of looks clunky and, like, when it's actually the full Mogera in battle besides like maybe the space thing. That's probably the best thing it is with it, but uh, it's okay. I don't mind it. It is a good improvement over what it looked like in the original Mysterions where it was kind of bulky and lanky. I kind of liked that They changed it up a bit. That's fair. I feel like uh, maybe it's because he has drill hands and he kind of <laughs> looks like he has like a, uh, I don't a buzzsaw on his back. For some reason, it kind of reminds me of a shitty robot Gigan. <laughs> I always thought he looked. How like dare a, you? I thought he looked like a crappy version, robot version of Woody Woodpecker. Yes, that's also I was true. About to say that. <laughs> that is also very true. Um, Venom, how, how did you feel about the Mogera design? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I I'm kind of middle of the road. It really didn't do a whole lot for me. In fact, when the drill came out of the face part when we were first introduced <laughs> to it, it, I thought it looked like a giant chicken. That yeah, or Woody Woodpecker, as uh, Donnie said. Yeah, I just uh, I don't know. It, when it was flying around, I thought it looked pretty cool. It looked like you know, all, it almost looked like a transformer, which I guess to an extent it kind of is. But um, when it was standing, it just doesn't really look very effective to me. It, it, all it has, it's lasers. I mean, all it's up close attacks. I don't care about the drills. All of it was fairly ineffective. Um, it just really didn't do a whole lot for me. Give me, give me Mecha Godzilla. Give me Mecha Go, uh, Ghidorah. Hell, give me Mecha Kong over this one. I would have taken. Wow. Mecha Kong. <laughs> give me Jet Jaguar. I do feel like the drill on the face, the drill, the the drill as a nose. Like they were like, we have to make this here for a reason. I know. Have him drill into the shoulder meat of Space Godzilla. That will convince everyone it's a good idea. But yeah, I agree. It's like I'm I'm with you. I'm middle of the road. I I don't think it's awful, but much like the the Heisei Mecha Godzilla design. Actually, I'll say this. I like the Mogera design more than I like the Mecha Godzilla Heisei design. Dragon Zorzilla. Yeah, I don't I don't <laughs> like uh chubby dinosaur. It looks like fucking the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Yes, it looks like the Tin Man and Barney had a child. <laughs> I'm not a fan um, at all. Okay, um, the Godzilla suit in this movie, uh, there's actually technically two in the water scenes that is actually using the Godzilla suit from Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla 2 um, because the new suit uh, could not handle the water. Uh, in fact, if you watch when Godzilla first comes up on Birth Island, you can actually see the end of the tail falling apart mm-hmm. uh, from mm-hmm. using the suit from the previous movie. But uh, for the new suit, 
they actually did do some improvements, including putting holes in the fingertips so they could let uh, sweat get out, uh, boots inside the feet to help keep a steadier place, especially since that's where a lot of the sweat builds up. Uh, yeah. But most importantly, motors in the head so that Godzilla could finally look left to right instead yes. of just up and down. And they showed you that he can look left to right multiple yeah. times in this movie. They made sure they used it. Yeah. 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 But the design does look good. I'm not a huge Heisei Godzilla suit fan. I think it's okay. It's definitely better than like the the late 60s 70s Godzilla suit. Um the, the thing the thing I have to say like I do like the continuity with the look of the Godzilla too. That's the only like you said, they kind of knew you with the Heisei series. At least the Godzilla kind of looks the same in most of the movies. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, in the Millennium series, for the most part, he looks pretty much the same also. It's really just yeah. a show where they changed it constantly. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. But uh, anyone have anything they want to say about the Godzilla suit? I'm a fan of this uh, design. I've always been a really big fan of the small head, big legged Godzilla designs. So yeah, this one, this one definitely does it for me. You hear uh, that, Japan? Thick thighs save lives. I like it because it's more <laughs> mobility. You know, I like that it has more expression and could actually do like it turns and stuff. Yeah, so I do like it. Yeah, the scales on his back aren't as you know protruding and obnoxious as in some of the other designs. I think they're I think they're just the right size in this one. Yeah. I mean I still prefer eighty nine and ninety one. But this one's right up there. I mean, I like you know, he looks like he's a he can do like almost anything. He can like brawl close range. But then, you know, it still looks like you know, he's got like the big muscular meat that he can take on anybody. And that's kind of what I like about Godzilla. You know what I also like about fucking uh, the guy who plays Godzilla in the Heisei series? He, since he was Gigan and Godzilla versus Gigan, he always, whenever Godzilla destroys a monster, he gives him like a happy dance. Like Gigan used to have his slappy hand dance. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Uh, we've already kind of talked about Little Godzilla, so I guess we'll we'll kind of, unless anyone has anything extra they want to say about the Little Godzilla design. I want an action figure of him. They. I do want a Funko them. Pop. Oh my God! X Plus makes a fantastic Little Godzilla. Nice. figure oh uh, i want it um uh space godzilla we've we've also kind of talked about but there, there might be more to say uh like i like, like i said uh, a huge fan of space godzilla i love the evil godzilla design i love the mouth design i love the head ornament i love the fucking chest and stomach it mm -hmm. just looks weird like I kind of waiting for like something to pop out of it. Like Biolante's head just comes out of it. Oh, the my, <laughs> fuck Jesus. That would have been fucking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love the crystals. I love the, the crystals that are on the end of his tail. <laughs> just all in all. I love the color. I love the look. I love the design space. Godzilla mwah, top, top five, uh, Godzilla enemies of all time for me. Um, Derek, do you have anything else you need to say about uh, the Space Godzilla design? Oh, I love it. Like, when he's star staring at uh, that little Godzilla, he's like, I'm going to rape you later, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Space Zalva for the win. No. I'm, I'm cutting you off. Don, uh, Don, how did you feel about Space Godzilla's suit? Like I said, he's my favorite aspect of the film. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. You did say that. Venom, do you got anything else to add? Uh, pretty much just reiterating what he, what I said earlier. I like when he's uh, standing on Earth, and I'm just not a big fan of his fully crystallized form when he's flying around. That's fair. I, I want to talk about some stuff I, I, I read today. Um, so uh, apparently this movie ha has a lot cut from it. Apparently, um, I don't know if they if actually made this runtime, but the director said his original cut was two and a half hours. Oof. Now, uh, there is stuff that is definitely cut. I found, uh, like, three instances of things that were cut. Um, only one of them I felt was really important. 
there is apparently a scene that was filmed and cut of when Space Godzilla shows up on Birth Island and captures Little Godzilla. There is a scene of Godzilla trying to open up the crystals to save Little Godzilla, but can't. He's too weak, and that's why he goes to the ocean to heal, because as we all know, Godzilla heals in the ocean. Um, for whatever fucking reason. Salt water. Um, and maybe it's, that's just his favorite place to sleep. Yeah. Um, but that was cut from the movie because the director said uh, he felt it was too serious, and that and because he was the he was told by the producers that the Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla two was too serious and too dark, so. They really? didn't want him to go that route for this movie, even though I feel like this movie is is pretty serious. Yeah, it's got jokes. Yeah, it's got a very cartoonish little Godzilla. But, like, d- Space Godzilla is probably the second scariest-looking kaiju in the Godzilla realm right after Destroya, since Destroya looks like the goddamn devil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, all, and, and the movie in general, is like, the fight takes place at night, uh, which... By the way, moi, thank you for doing night scenes that actually look good. Yeah. Uh, I th- Maybe it's something with suits. Maybe, like, CGI in nights doesn't look good. But when you have it in, in suits, I guess, on a soundstage being nighttime, it just looks great. So I thought that scene was – I want to see that scene. I looked for it. I can't find that scene anywhere, so I guess it's never been released or at least hasn't made its way onto YouTube. Um mm-hmm. But that is a scene I wish was put back in the fucking movie. Because that would... I think that would improve the movie. For sure. Mm. Um, I agree. I think that's all I've got for Space God. There are There there is, like, other information. I did find, like, some other cool stuff. Like, apparently in the late 70s, they did want to do a Space Godzilla movie. But it technically has nothing to do with, you know, this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, originally Mecha Godzilla was supposed to be in the movie, but they changed it to Mogera. Uh, this is Godzilla's 40th anniversary movie. Um, that's right. Yeah. So that's fun. Oh, I just remember what I want to talk about. Gamera Guardian of the Universe. Uh, right after this movie came out, uh, I about six months after this movie came out, Gamera Guardian of the Universe came out. Uh, and. Well, Space Godzilla did make more money theatrically because of the Godzilla name. Uh, critically, Gamma yeah, Guardian of the better. Universe slayed everything. It got showings in America while, while Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla got no theatrical showings. Gamma did. Uh, uh, it seems like Gamma bucked a lot of its own trends from its own franchise and took things from older Godzilla movies and made it work for Gamera. It wasn't held down by the legacy of Gamera because uh, the the creators of the uh, of the new Gamera um, for the 90s said they, they found out that Americans look at Gamera like comedies. They're being riffed on Mystery Science Theater. They, they're like looked at as cheap comedy kids movies. And uh, they felt that since the Gamera movies were kind of aimed towards uh, a kid audience in Japan because of the Friends of Children, that they wanted to kind of get rid of that. Um, And the Gamera movie did a lot of things better than the Godzilla movies in the Heisei era, especially psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, it's so much better in Guardian of the Universe. But it's very important... To, to know that um, it was actually one of the reasons that we got Godzilla vs. Destroya because mm-hmm. Toho at this point, seeing Gamera in the Guardian universe, just did not know what to do. And the only reason they made Space Godzilla and Destroya was because the American movie got pushed back. So, I wonder uh, why. Yeah, so <laughs> I wanted to bring bring that up because in both books that I read while doing my Space Godzilla research, both of them brought up how important the impact of Gamer Guardian of the Universe was um, in the kaiju world for between Space Godzilla and um, Destroya. Destroya. Because right after Destroya came out, 
Gamera 2 came out. And then we didn't get another Godzilla movie, but we got another Gamera movie. So I thought that was very, just very interesting in general. Um, Hell yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm okay, wondering, well, I'm wondering where Toho got their information that Gamera is looked upon as more of a kids movie in the U.S. as opposed to Godzilla. No, no, that's but... not from Toho. That's from the people oh. who were making the Gamera. One of the guys, Kaneko. Like, I, oh. It might have been him. I can't remember. He said he was in um, America. And someone showed him the Mystery Science Theater clip of, of Gamera vs. Garyon where Gamera's doing the fucking flip on the poles. <laughs> yeah, gymnastics. And showed it to him saying, oh my god, this is the funniest thing ever. Look how stupid this is. And showed him the Mystery Science Theater clip. Mm-hmm. And he said, and he, and he was just like, I didn't know that America looked at this as, as a dumb children's comedy. And... Like, I know in Japan, yeah, it's kind of like, like, it was kind of a children's thing. It was lower budget. And Gamer Guarding the Universe was way lower budget than Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. But they went back to a more su- to, uh, edgy Subaraya style of, of the suitmation and the wire effects and the pyrotechnics that just worked for it. Um, we got to cover Gamer Guarding the Universe soon. Mm-hmm. We need to. Um, so, yeah, it's... it's Oh, that's amazing. Okay. I think uh, it's Ultraman report time. Huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. We've got Ultraman episode 19, The Demon Once More. Came out November 20th, 1966. Uh, an underground capsule is found at a construction site. Um... They think it's, uh, they basically think this capsule is a time capsule for some reason because apparently they bury time capsules, so they're assuming other ones did. <laughs> but then they find a fossil, uh, kind of like they did in Godzilla 1954. And they were like, well, this fossil's, you know, 9,000 years old. And there was no civilization back then. But then later they're like, oh, there was a civilization back then. So whatever. Uh, Hayata and Ito uh, end up going with the scientists to help figure out uh, what's going on with it. Um, But the capsule is missing a part and they think it's just destroyed. But actually it was picked up and put in the dirt in the back of a truck and it falls off the truck. And later that night it is released by lightning from the thunderstorm. Uh, And we get to see the red monster named Vanilla. I guess it's Vanilla? Looks Mm -hmm. like Vanilla. I called him Artie Lang in my notes. That's fair. Uh, I called him Trumpy. Oh, Trumpy. Um, <laughs> you can do stupid things. Yes. Uh, thank you, Venom. I love that reference. Um, so while that's happening, uh, they're looking at this like plate, trying to figure out uh, what it is, and Ito ends up dropping it, and they find out that light reflecting off of it puts a cipher on the wall, so they transcribing it, thinking it looks very much like the writings of the Mu Empire, which the Mu Empire is related to Atlantis, stuff like that. Very fun stuff. So, uh, Arashi is sent out to go look at the red monster, Vanilla, and uh, Ito is asked to join him. So the Captain Ito end up going to join him. Hayata is told by the scientists that they descri- transcribed the plate, and, well, the capsule was a prison prison that they had liquefied two different monsters in to hold forever. If you can liquefy it, why couldn't you just kill it? <laughs> just throwing a question out there. Uh, but then I guess if they did that, we wouldn't have an episode. True that. I wonder how they did liquefy it. I don't know, but yeah. if they did liquefy it, what would happen if I drink it? Because oh, it looks nice. like Kool-Aid. Does look like Kool Aid or Flavor Aid. You can drink it in Brazil with Jim Jones. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, um, at this point, the blue monster, Aborus, appears. Whoa. <laughs> As the science team gathers together, uh, science patrol team, uh, they meet the monsters fighting with each other at a stadium. Um, I didn't, I forgot, I should have asked you this, Dawn. Did you have like a breakdown of the two monsters fighting or just when Ultraman shows up? I can do both if you want me to. Um 
I mean, the, yeah. Ultraman, the Ultraman fight's going to be a lot more technical. Okay, yeah, we'll just save it for that. So, they're fighting. Arashi uses his atom gun and aims for the eyes. He hits Vanilla, and as Vanilla falls, Arboros uses the opportunity to hit him with acidic foam, causing his skin to fucking melt and die. And technically, before the interference from the science patrol, they seemed pretty evenly matched. Yeah. Uh, so, with Vanilla dead... Someone's got to fight Alvaros. You know what that means. Don, take it over. Okay. As uh, Ultraman appears, he lands in the stadium and squares off against Abaros, who charges his new opponent. Sizing each other up, Abaros fires a foam blast that Ultraman leaps over and delivers a flying kick to Abaros, but falls to the ground after landing. Rushing his fallen opponent, Abaros falls on top of Ultraman and tries to grapple with him, rolling around on top before Ultraman finally manages to push Abaros up enough to deliver a kick to the midsection and separate the two creatures. After gaining his, regaining his footing, Abaros sprays Ultraman in the face with a hot, thick, sticky white foam, momentarily <laughs> freezing him. Sorry. <laughs> right. Oh, I love this show. <laughs> Okay, Abaris sprays Ultraman in the face with his foam breath, momentarily freezing him in place and causing concern from the science patrol gathered outside the stadium. Using his powers, Ultraman breaks free of the goo, but the color timer is now blinking rapidly. Ultra Abaris sees this and charges, causing Ultraman to block his attacks and the two begin grappling before Ultraman fires a series of chops to the creature's head and neck before grabbing his horn and tossing Abaris into the stadium scoreboard. The prone monster fires its, fo its foam spray at Ultraman, who dodges and fires a specium ray, causing the creature to fire another spray stream at Ultraman again. Ultraman dodges and fires a second specium blast at Abras, who repeats the process a third time. A third time dodging the spray blast, Ultraman fires a third specium ray, destroying Abras completely. And then the episode ends just out of nowhere with uh, Ido yeah. saying that uh, Ultraman won. And then Very it just abrupt. ends. It's a close-up yep. of Ultraman's bulge. Yeah, I, it, I, I, it, out of nowhere. So, uh, so real quick before we get into how everyone felt, uh, uh, Abaros is a modified Red King suit, and mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Abaros' suit would then become modified to become Red King Two. Uh, his roar is that of Baragon, and uh, Red Vanilla is a speed-up Angris roar. So that's about all the information I could find on those two from this specific Ultraman series. So with that being said, Mr. Venom, how did you feel about this Ultraman episode? This was a fun episode. I liked that it wasn't ultra heavy on story. You know, we got a very simple story with the finding of that capsule um, and, you know, the releasing of the of our two kaiju for the episode. I thought this was a very action packed episode. I mean, we got twice as much kaiju action as we usually do because of our two alien kaiju kind of going after each other. Um, I enjoyed the design of both of them. Uh, you know, I mentioned Trumpy from the movie Pod People, and I mean, I still I stick with that. His face looked to me almost like a pinhead version, not pinhead from Hellraiser, but pinhead from Freaks or American Horror Story, if you want to go with that. Um, almost like I said, a pinhead version of Trumpy, just, you know, very tall and bipedal. So that was pretty cool. And then I liked um, the blue kaiju, uh, Vanilla, because no, the he blue looked, one's Abaris. Oh, I'm sorry, Abaris. Um, I his his head looked exactly like uh, the Pokemon Onyx. If anybody's into Pokemon, oh, yes. yeah, his the head Pokemon is Blue exactly right Onyx. now. <laughs> I'm playing Pokemon Blue right now, and I want to say Nidoking King is broken as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I'm not, I'm not as big a Pokemon fan as I used to be. But I mean, I did watch the original series, and yeah, as soon as I saw that uh, Abaris, uh, I'm like, whoa, that looks exactly like Onyx. The horn, the the, the kind of rounded off rock like teeth, um, the very wide, you know, gaping maw uh, on the front of his face. So yeah. Um, overall, just a really, really fun episode. Action packed. Didn't really concentrate too much on the science patrol, and uh, just overall satisfying. I wish they would have done a little bit more with the ending because it was just a little too abrupt. 
for this type of show to just end the kaiju battle and then boop go to credits it just it's a little much you know it, it was I, a, a I, city I, I of the living dead ending. From, <laughs> i need my funny closing line from ito to kind of put a cherry on top of my ultraman sunday but yeah overall really enjoyed the episode though all right Derek, what did you think yeah i dug the hell out of it you know, I like kind of like the thing, the mystery of what these two liquids were. And it was kind of funny because we, you know, the one liquid was going through like the, con, you know, the soil truck. <laughs> I kind of like that kind of funny shit like that. Uh, the two monsters themselves, Spinella, who looks like Artie Lang with the enclosed nose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I kind of dig him. It's like a coca that shoots fire out of his mouth. I like it. And uh, Avaros, who looks like if Rocksteady from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fucked a putty from Power Rangers. Wow. <laughs> I dig him. They're funny. And every time he sprayed his spray, I'm like, he's just shooting bubble baths and shit on these people. That's what it is. It looks like bubble baths. I was cracking the fuck up. You gotta hit him with that bubble beam. <laughs> uh, the or as Don said, the hot, melty beam <laughs> of white foam. Oh my foam. god! No more hot white foam references, please. <laughs> no. Um, okay, I, Don. I dug, the epi- I dug the episode all together, and you know, uh, I agree with Venom. It did kind of interrupt with the bald shot of Alter Man. <laughs> yep. All right, Don. What did you think? Yeah, I have a lot of fun with this. Um. I mean, like you said, I really wish that they would have explained how Vega managed to defeat the creatures b- or previously, because, I mean, that could have been useful information to capture them once again, instead of wasting their time firing, you know, I mean, that would have been like a fun ploy to see how they would have handled, you know, recreating the steps that led to them being captured in the first place. Yeah, if you're going to to lock them up. Right. At, at least give instructions of, hey, if they escape, this is what you do. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's kind of like one of those, like, basic questions that I would really like answered. Yeah, I mean, I know I love the idea that Ito's clumsiness actually causes them to figure it out. Because the idea of him holding it up and then it slipping and falling and then, oh, shit, look, it actually reflects on the wall. <laughs> I um, agree. I- Ito yeah. is either always showing us how actually smart he is or how he's just sometimes an accidental genius. Yeah. I really mm-hmm. think you may be onto something with him being on the spectrum. I, I I'm, dude, I I'm know. Starting, right. I'm starting to think that there may be something to that. I mean, you know, this is just like another example of him offering something stupid that actually does work. You know, I mean, you know, we talked about that a, a few times when, you know, his idea of, well, let's just let the monster sleep. You know, yes. when we talked about that, I mean, you know, this is like just another one where all of it, where he, he just does something, you know, like unconventional that just happens to work. Exactly. I'm, like, oh, man, I, yeah, I, I'm in agreement with everything Don just said. I'm starting to come around to that thing. I think there, you may be onto something. Ito is an idiot savant. Yeah. I'm not actually a huge fan of the fight between a Boris and Vanilla. I think it's kind of vanilla, actually. They just stand around grappling. I mean, you know, the only yeah. thing that they really do is just fall over the stadium wall. I mean, the other time they're just kind of like holding on to each other and just like pushing each other. So, you know, I mean, they both get great destruction sequences. You know, a Boris has the great thing where he melts the, you know, apartment buildings with those with that breath thing he does. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The, the fight's not the fight with Ultraman is not bad. Yeah, I made the joke purposefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I purposely set that up. But overall I, I have fun with it. You know, Venom said it, it's fast, it's fun, it's zippy, you know, it's it's kind of the for, you know, it's the Ultraman formula. Something happens, monster appears, Science Patrol fights it, learns how to stop it, can't do it. Ultraman shows up and saves the day. You know, it's a formula and it works. It's not the best of the series. It's just a, it's a, you know, fun entry in the canon and it has two monsters appear. So, yeah. And I'm going to piggyback on that. Uh, This episode really is just a stripped down basic Ultraman formula with no, 
nothing to make it really stand out. In fact, especially with the abrupt ending, the yeah. episode just feels like it's missing something. It's 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 just missing explanations. It just feels it feels lazily. It feels like it's a lazy episode. It's lazily efficient. It's, yes, because it's it's lazy, but at the same time, you're right. It's so efficient. It gets from point A to point B so fast that you don't notice it. And in like watching it, I was just kind of like, okay, that was an okay episode. It's something's not right about it, but it's okay. But like as we're describing it as we're talking about it especially with what don says i i kind of realized that yeah that's it, it it's the ultraman formula stripped down all the way it has nothing it doesn't have that extra special moment that puts it over the top like some of the other ones do it's just basic here you go filler episode it's not good it's not bad it's just there and Maybe if they would have had something at the end, like whether it's, you know, Ido explaining something kind of funnily or or just something there, time capsule joke or anything. But that abrupt ending, like, really made me go, well, well what the fuck was that? Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's a pretty middle-of-the-road episode. This is a good episode to just go... Here's what the basic Ultraman formula stripped down is. It's, you know, maybe after the first one, this could be like another one if you're just, you know, okay, here's like the five best episodes of Ultraman to get you into it. You maybe throw, well, I, I don't maybe know not, about that. Well, maybe not five, but like five <laughs> best to give you an idea of what he's like. Yeah. Yeah, it felt like they tried to jam pack a lot more into this episode than in a standard Ultraman episode, which is probably why we got that abrupt ending, because obviously this is a TV show and, you know, they obviously have their time slot that they have to fill and they can't go over. And because they added an extra kaiju fight and an extra kaiju in general, um, you know, that's why we're lacking in a little bit of human story in this one, which I'm definitely not going to complain about. You're right. I didn't think about that. That's really what it is. Uh, the, The extra kaiju fight. We normally would have had exposition of a mystery or human drama or something like that. Yeah. And it's not there. Because when you first started talking, you were like, it's so jam-packed. I was like, really? I feel like there's supposed to be more here and they cut it out. But that's because I'm thinking of the the human uh, narrative of it. And Mm -hmm. really, in this episode, that's what they did. They took out the human narrative and was like... Here's an extra kaiju fight. We don't feel like writing this week. Yeah. <laughs> one part that I liked about it too is the one part that like, cracked me the fuck up is uh I think it's the chief and uh Hirashi there in the plane. It, I could be mistaken, but you know they're in, flying over Vanilla, and then once the airplane, the Air Force airplane is going, okay, we could go back to HQ now. Let's get out of here. <laughs> like, fuck oh, this. that was uh Ido and the Ido, captain. Yeah, yeah Ido and the captain. Yeah. <laughs> I do like the joke uh, where where the captain, you know, gives Ito the job of going with Hayata to check with scientists. And uh, Ito's just like, you have to have a high intelligence for this job as he's making fun of Arashi. And the captain's just like, that is not how we act here. <laughs> like he's getting on to a child, you know? And once again, it just kind of showed the childlike nature of Ido. And then they bring it back towards the end when, when, when they reference that joke again. And I really liked that. I, I really like Ido as a character. That's the other thing. Hayata is the most boring character on the Science Patrol. But it's because he's Ultraman. Like, but, mm-hmm. like, Arashi is a great character. Fuji's a great character. Ido's a good character. The Captain could probably need a little bit more but i kind of like that he's more stern the entire time because he's the captain yeah and then hayat is just kind of bland as a character we don't really know him outside of the science patrol either we've seen all of them like more outside like ito and fuji like shopping and shit in that one episode where they did the pearl shopping and we also just get (laughs) more of personalities especially from ito and arashi and fuji and we don't really get that as much with the captain or Hayata. Those two are too like are just way too straight laced or something. 
And you can see it in this episode because it's it's Arashi and and Ido that are are kind of giving us the the you know the laughs, the haha, the jokes. It's it's them. Yeah. Why everyone else is yeah. all serious? Mm-hmm. Why so, I'm so serious? <laughs> exactly. Um, so damn yes, that's it. We're guys. Uh, we we know it's been a couple months. Uh, I had to take a, a two month uh, hiatus from podcasting. But I'm so glad to be back and recording. This is my first podcast in two months. Recording with with you know some of my favorite people. Um, I don't have anything to promote because I haven't been recording. But these guys, on the other hand, they might have something. So let's check it out. Um, Derek, we're going to start with you. Uh, what have you been recording lately? Tell everybody so that they can go take a look. Okay. Uh, first up... New episode of Cellular Dissection should be out next week, where me and Miss Carly discussed a Western with uh, Mr. Parker from YouTube, Dave, who's been on 22 Shots and Fresh Cuts with Venom. Uh, we uh, isn't about... his his stuff called Screaming Toilet? Yeah, that's his website. Yes. But okay. Was, yeah. Uh, Mr. Parker, of course, is one of the guys that got me into YouTube when I first started YouTube in general, so it was good to... Cool to actually podcast him for once. So we talked about Sam Peck and Paws the Wild Bunch on that episode. And it was a good discussion. We kind of did it a little differently than we would normally do. Uh, I didn't go really plot for plot on that movie because that movie's kind of a deep one to talk about from scene to scene. And, you know, it was a little bit more easier flowing if we just talk about it naturally, about what we liked and disliked. And just talked about certain scenes in the movie instead of going through the whole movie, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. Some movies are, it's better to go scene by scene. And then there's other movies where you just want to have an open discussion. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I kind of did that a little bit differently for that episode since we had another third person on too. And uh, also Cinema Attack just recorded last night, as Mr. Venom knows, because he was on that episode. Uh It's a podcast extravaganza, as I would like to call it, when uh, Venom and his co-hosts of In the Mic of Madness, Rebecca Reinhardt, joined me, Matt, and Dubby to talk about the Blood Trilogy from Herschel Gordon Lewis. We talked about Blood Feast, 2000 Maniacs, and Color Me Blood Red. It was a fun time, and I had so much fun and enjoyed it. It was a ride. I can't wait to hear back that episode when it's done. And then, uh, no more room in hell recording next week. Not sure if I want to tell you that, but the latest episode out, uh, we talked about deep star six and Leviathan. If you haven't checked that out yet, check it out. And, uh, I'm recording this Thursday with my new podcast. Cause I have five now guys since the last time we recorded, because I started a podcast with miss Lacey Lou. From Cut to the Chase called They're Here Podcast. I have to always do that whenever she says they hear because she told me to. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we're doing our underrated dark comedies next Thursday. So that show should be out sometime, maybe at the end of the week or maybe the beginning of the week after. I'm not really sure. Depends on the timing of when it's edited. But that's about it for me. All right, uh, Don, what do you got? Well, it's been over a month now, but um, the latest episode of Horror Mafia was a uh, look at Class of Newcomb High, which was a uh, first-time watch for me, so uh, definitely turned out a lot of fun. As for a follow-up, uh, your guess is as good as mine. So, Fair enough. Uh, I have a Class of Newcomb High poster signed by Lloyd Kaufman. <laughs> nice. nice. And a Blu-ray <laughs> of that movie signed by him. I like that movie a lot. It's a lot of fun. All right, Venom, what do you got? All right, so Derek already mentioned the latest episode of No More Room in Hell, but on the the, uh, sister podcast, the sidecast for that one, Fresh Cuts, on the latest episode, Mike Merriman and myself welcomed Andrew Schroyer from the Woodsboro Bros podcast. Um, It was his debut on Fresh Cuts, and we talked about the recently released Fantasy Island adaptation um from blumhouse on the next episode of fresh cuts we'll be looking at um the movie that just came out this weekend which is brahms the boy 2 
um, that hopefully, uh, I believe Scott Crawford from Friday Nightmares is going to be joining us for that one. Which you can um, hear here on the Kill the Cast banner. Yes, exactly. He is um, here. I also got to say, you always say that uh, uh, Fresh Cuts is a sister podcast to No More Room in Hell. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest. Fresh Cuts is is the podcast on that feed and no more room in hell is the sister podcast <laughs> well no more we consider no more room in hell the main show because that's that was the one that started it all fresh cuts was meant to be the side cast where we only look at brand new movies we only look at the newest of the new but because mike merriman and myself basically go to see every single horror theatrical release Plus, we watch almost all of the brand new VOD stuff that comes out as well uh, with me working at DirecTV and, you know, Mike uh, using more nefarious means, you know, we're able to see all of these new VOD releases. So, you know, Fresh Cuts is going to be the show that we have the most episodes of, obviously, because it's a weekly show. On top of the fact that one week in January, we actually did two episodes. Um, and actually in February, same thing. We did two episodes in one week. So, I mean, that's the one that's obviously going to be heard the most. But, you know, No More Room in Hell, you know, is the one where we kind of take more deep dives. Because we don't really do uh, deep dives on Fresh Cuts. It's more our guttural reactions, what we think of it. And then we'll go, you know, in the spoiler section, we'll do a scene-by-scene breakdown. But it, we don't really go deep on, like, themes and comments commentary and things like that about it so yeah, yeah I, I see your point though because i think fresh i just cuts wanted to, i was show. just making a joke well i just wanted to poke you with fresh a stick cuts is the one that most people probably hear the most of because we're constantly releasing episodes so it, it's valid yeah it's valid. <laughs> it depends on like the schedule and sometimes those episodes and plus yeah and fresh cuts are those little shorter episodes too which some people prefer short episodes um, as opposed to our, you know, three plus hour epics on the main show. So, you know, some people just prefer it. So, you, you know, it's a valid point either way, joke or not. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, and, and then the, some of the newer shows that I've joined recently. Uh, the first one is called It's Not Horror, OK, which is a movie commentary podcast that I do with both uh, members of the Friday Nightmares podcast, Heather Powell and Scott Crawford. Neil Lemoy is the host of that show. We also have Android Virus um, from Android Vision, who joins us on that show as well. On the last episode, we looked at the Canon Films classic, quote unquote classic, Ninja 3 The Domination, which is an absolute favorite of mine. Love it. Uh, those who don't know, I absolutely love those 80s Shokasugi slash canon ninja movies, you know, Nine Deaths of the Ninja, Enter the Ninja, those types of movies. And Ninja 3 The Domination, you know, though not a great film, is an absolute guilty pleasure of mine. I saw it when it was brand new and I've always loved it. And to this day, I love it. So um, that podcast, like I said, is out now on our next episode. We're going to be looking at Mad Foxes, which is an odd movie from the 80s. Um, I've, I've never seen it, so this is going to be uh, quite an experience to do a, a movie commentary during a first watch, but I'm still excited for it. Um, and then, as uh, Derek mentioned earlier, the latest show that I joined is called In the Mic of Madness, with the beautiful Rebecca Reinhardt, um, we are in the middle of our Friday the 13th retrospective where we're looking at one movie per episode. On the latest episode that's available now, we look at Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Uh, my my partner in crime on most of my podcasts, Mike Merriman, joined us on that one. And then, of course, on the next one, as a numerical order would dictate, we'll be looking at Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. And we're, we will have the lovely Lacey Lou joining us on that one in celebration of Women in Horror Month. And um, as far as social media, if you want to hit me up real quick, Twitter, I am at Jerry Venom. Uh, Instagram, I am at Venom Horror. Uh, on Facebook, I'm just playing old Mr. Venom. And if you want to drop me an email about any of my shows, the address is Mr. Venom Podcasts at gmail.com. Fucking great! Right. Before we end this, I just gotta say, last night when me and Venom recorded the, I I had him do the longer version of that with like <laughs> the hiatus shows, and Matt's reaction was just, oh my god, <laughs> <That> <laughs> it was the greatest reaction. Time. 
um okay so uh i technically don't have anything to promote uh for me podcast wise that's come out because i haven't been here but i do want to say uh definitely check out uh the friday nightmares podcast with scott crawford and uh heather powell it is fantastic they've done two great episodes yes i agree Uh, it is it is on the kill the cast banner it's the first show that we've had on here that does not have me on here you can listen to kill the cast and i'm not talking it's amazing I don't and know I, how this happened. And I should mention that uh, Scott and Heather are also going to be on the next episode of Cinema Attack that's being prepped at this moment. So nice. it's going to be exciting. <laughs> Very nice. Um, but uh, the next two Kill the Cast episodes, uh, 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 like a week from when you hear this, we'll be recording a double feature of Kenneth's choice of Dog Soldiers and Jay's uh, choice, which... which Kind of fits this show a little bit of uh, the Giver Two Dark Hero. Ooh. So monster suits, monster suits, um, and then after that, we will be doing a movie from the '80s, depending on a poll that is in Kill the Cast. Last time I looked, From Beyond is winning, so it might be From Beyond. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure yet. Quit voting for Night of the Comet, goddammit. Yes, please. I don't want to watch that movie. I, that was I, I put that on there as a joke, just like I in the other tier that lost. I put Child's Play in there. I don't uh, want to do those shitty movies. Night of the Comets boring. Boat Night of the Creeps. Yes, please. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, that is it for us. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll be back with a non Godzilla episode uh, next time. Hopefully, uh, you won't have to wait another couple of months this time. We'll be back uh, in March. You'll see us. You'll love us. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, to Venom, Derek, and Don for uh, being easy with me on my uh, two-month hiatus for the return of this podcast. Thank you for the listeners. Uh, thank you for anyone out there just fucking loving Kaiju, uh, worshiping some Godzilla. We love it. Uh, we are in... Uh, just a great time for kaiju in general so i hope everyone is having a good time out there thank you uh to my co-host here uh for doing a wonderful show on this uh wonderful show a wonderful job on this show tonight i really appreciate it uh so we'll be back sometime in march that's next month right yep, yep. march march yeah. yeah cool i knew that Definitely mm-hmm. knew that. It wasn't yep. a Japanese name. I didn't need Don to correct me. Uh, <laughs> Wait, you said my name? What am I supposed to correct you on? Uh, <laughs> I, no, it wasn't a Japanese name. Oh, I just heard my name and asked for pronunciation help. So uh, Yeah. Um, so that's it, guys. Thank you for joining us for these visions of Monster and Land. Remember, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space loves you. And go listen to all these guys' shows. They're wonderful shows. And uh, and make sure you don't it. steal any little Godzillas. <laughs> steal all the little Godzillas and bring them to me. <laughs> Maybe what? All right, you know what? Hold up. Venom didn't say it during the show, but he said it before it with little Godzilla. Venom, go ahead and say it. You know, I'm not sure what I said. Yoda, Yoda. Yoda, Oh, oh, yeah, baby. Oh, right, that's right. That little Godzilla would kick baby Yoda's ass. So fuck that little green bastard. Yes, that's (laughs) it, guys. We're out of here. Little Godzilla for life. Thank you. Woohoo! If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema Psyops, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts. Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. 
horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.